power of storytelling. Um, so as you know, people don't care about what you sell, they care about why you're selling it. So the speaker tonight, Kendall Young, she is, a, she is the CEO and founder of a local real estate company called Diggs. And her real estate company thrives on the power of storytelling. So she is going to explain her method of storytelling and how we can incorporate it into our businesses. So a little bit about Kendall. She has been a successful residential real estate agent for over three decades. She is a published writer for several industry publications and is a contributor to two industry books. She has been named on several most influential lists and is a popular speaker, social media influencer, and a thought leader. In 2014, Young launched Diggs, a boutique residential real estate brokerage located in Montrose. A Los Angeles native, she is an unapologetic geek whose sports be not entirely useful at the watch, which may be debatable <laughs> among this group. <laughs> uh, she loves to cook, eat, and laugh, mostly at herself, while hanging out with her handsome hubby and sometimes adoring kids. So please welcome her onto the stage. If this thing doesn't work, I'll just shout at y'all. So it's not because I'm mad at you, it's because this is in, inconsistent. Hi there, thank you so much for coming out for this talk. Um, I've heard from several of you already that the idea of using storytelling is resonating with you as a way of reaching your customers, building your business, and creating loyalty. But perhaps you're a little bit wondering, how to do storytelling. And I promise you, we're gonna get into that. And I'll be doing that through showing you what I've been doing, uh, well actually, for decades. I, I didn't even know that I was doing storytelling in the very beginning. So, let's, let's, let's make this thing work. Oh, here we go. <laughs> when I got into real estate, which was 31 years ago, fax machines were not yet popular. Cell phones were just science fiction. And a really cool real estate agent would sport a beaver on her waistband. That's how long it has been. And when I got into real estate, real estate advertising looked pretty much like this. Home for sale, freshly painted, in slash out. This Spanish style home has a charming front CTYD. That's the courtyard. You have to know real estate speak to decode these things. Three beds slash two bath, 1600 SF, that's square foot with HDWD floors. Anybody know what that is? Hardwood! You guys know how to speak real estate. <laughs> Central heat, air, okay, how about WDFP? Wood burning fireplace, that is correct. Copper plum, two times, that's double hung. Uh, wood windows, close to schools and transportation. Now why did the ads look like this? You paid and by the letter. Paid by the letter, exactly. Back then, our medium for advertising anything was pretty much newspapers, classified was the most economical, display ads if you had a little more cash, right? You could do postcards, otherwise known as junk mail. If you were really flush with cash, maybe you could do a billboard or a bus bench, um, or if you were a big company, maybe you could do a little bit of television, late night cable, of course. Television, or maybe you could do some radio. But most people, that wasn't even an option, right? So we're talking about print media that was very limited in the space that you could do. It was pretty expensive. In fact, every ad was pretty much a large portion of any agent's marketing budget, assuming they had a marketing budget. Um, and it was infrequent, relatively speaking. So you had to be very economical with what you were doing. Um, and it led to what I call spray and pray advertising, okay? So that meant that because you were only gonna do one ad, it's gonna be in the newspaper maybe, and so you're gonna spray it to every single person who's reading that newspaper, whether they're homeless, homed, rich, poor, or maybe just a 10-year-old who was working on their current events article for their fourth grade class. Everybody saw that one, and you were hoping, praying. You were praying, that the person who wanted me and desired your services was going to see that ad and be motivated to some kind of action. Now the problem with spray and pay advertising is that because you're speaking to a very general audience, 
you're going to stick to the highest ROI message, things that you think are really going to work. So you wind up talking about your features. The house has this, this, and that. Want to buy it? Or you're going to be talking about claims. I have this credential, these awards, and I am number one in such and such a marketplace. Want to work with me? And the problem with features and claims, being as general as they are, is that people are pretty much bored to tears. Right? I mean, it's just boring. Unless you're actually needing the house with the hardwood floors and the double hung windows, you yeah, lack attention to it at all. Boring, 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 boring. So, in today's world, we have lots of digital media, right? We've got YouTube, we have our websites, we have email that we can use. Well, you can get some new junk mail. But you know, if you, you've got it out there, you can email. You could write blog posts, put something on Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram stories. There's a ton of platforms that you can now use. And what's really cool about it is that almost all of this advertising is entirely free, which means that you can, well, if you wanted to, spray and pray quite frequently. <laughs> the problem with taking old methods and putting them on the new digital media is that, well, more boring is just more boring. And who needs that? What I'd like for you to think about is the idea that now that we have these tools that we never had access to before, that we use them in a way that is more effective, that connects more, and is more valuable to the people who are receiving the message. Does that sound like a good idea? Yeah. Yeah, right? I mean, don't you think that the people would be pay more attention and feel better about you as a company or a service or an expert if you were giving them a story that actually connected to who they were. So let's talk about that. Why does it work? Well, I already gave you the Simon Sinek quote, but I kind of like this quote better. It comes from Verna Jiwa. She wrote a book called Difference, which was actually the playbook on which I modeled my brokerage. And she says, no one cares how you are different, which really is what using features and claims is, right? No one cares how you're different. They care about how you'll make a difference. Now think about it. No one needs a quarter inch drill, right? What they need is a quarter inch hole. The drill is just how you're gonna get what you want. How are you going to make a difference? And this is where I think storytelling can be incredibly effective. So let's take a look at the ad that I talked about at the top. Now you're not gonna be able to read this, I'm gonna read it for you. Your home should be your peace your soul, and your personal Shangri-La. It starts with a red tiled roof and shaded courtyard, with tinkling fountain and abundant room for a gathering of friends. Self-important hipsters can keep walking. This is a place for meditation, truth, good food, great blues guitar. The artist's soul is fed on period details like stencil beams, vintage bathroom tile, and meticulously preserved floors, windows, doors, and moldings. Special spots are everywhere a wine cave, a massage room, a covered patio that Hemingway would covet. Modern amenities include copper pipe and newly refurbished central air conditioning. Now, this is a story. The first one was talking about the features and benefits of the house. I published this particular story for a house that was for sale, and take a look at the picture. Isn't that a picture what invites you in? Wouldn't you want to just go inside that house and find out who lives there? Wouldn't you like to be the person who lives there? Using this story enticed buyers from urban Los Angeles, even from the west side of Los Angeles, to come to a neighborhood, to a city that they never would have considered because they were drawn into this story. It resonated with that. It made them feel like this was a house where they could live out their lives. So this is the first part about storytelling. You need to understand that the story is not about you. Arguably, it's not even about your product. It's about what you or your product or your service does for the person receiving your message. And why do stories work? Let's think about this. In the first ad, we were talking about the features that the house had. When you listen to that ad, what was lighting up in your brain was your language center. Your language center in your brain was saying, ah, here are some symbols. I need to decode those symbols and I need to figure out what those, what those words mean. I need to attach those words to something that I've had experience with. Okay, all right, decode, decode, decode. Storytelling, however, 
and this is your brain on stories, when you listen or engage with a story, all of the parts of your brain that would be needed to experience the story that you are that you are reading or hearing will light up. So we talked about how this is a place for people who want good food. Now the parts of your brain that is thinking about good food and taste and smells. I talked about the tinkling fountain. So the parts of your brain that talks that that, that deals with hearing and processing sounds that all gets lit up. So when you are hearing a story. Your brain is completely engaged in what you are, in what you're thinking of. When your brain is engaged, you are engaged. That's why. That's one of the reasons why stories are so effective. Another reason the stories are effective is that stories unfold exactly the way we think. There's a there's a what we call a cause and effect. This happened, then this happened, then this happened, and this is the result of it. When you connect your cause with your effect. And you have all of the parts of your brain engaged. You have a very powerful motivator, and that is what we're doing. Even if you're a tech startup out here, and I know several of you are out there, and you're not even selling anything yet, but you need to get investors. You need to get people invested and bought into your company. Even you, you are selling something. You're selling your dream. I call it spinning the dream. Stories are very, very effective in this particular way. So remember, we talked about this drill, right? So let's talk about. How you do stories? Science tells us that human beings are motivated to action for one of two things: they're either trying to move away from pain, solve a problem, right, or they're trying to move towards a pleasure. Pain, pleasure. These are the two major motivators for human behavior. So let's first talk about how we use stories to solve a pain. They already told you the story about how you don't need a drill. You need a quarter tall, right? Let's talk about how I've used it in my real estate business. So this is an ad that I did, um, and forgive the way it looks. This was before we knew more about graphic design, so I'll just I'll just give it to you. We still can't believe how much you did finding our new home so fast, having it painted before we moved in, but mostly what you did to ease Alex's heart wrenching transition. Leaving friends behind was not easy for Alex. But when we turned the corner of our new street and saw the third grade class waiting to welcome us, I knew that everything was going to be all right. Last night we had a sleepover with Alex's new best friends. I don't think Alex realizes why we're so happy, but I do. Thank you. Now this is a pain. Alex is a boy on the autism spectrum. The transition of moving to a new house is extraordinarily difficult for him. This family needed to figure out how to solve that pain and move into a new house. They're quite frightened of it. So this story talks about how this family moved through this and resolved the pain, and now Alex is happy. Here's another example of. <laughs> oh, there we go. All right, two dogs, a cat, and another dog are on the way. It was time for a bigger house. We went straight to our agent, Kendall Young. She sold our house and found us a new place. Thanks to Kendall, at least one of life's big events is easily managed. Promises made, promises kept. What's the pain here? The pain here is that needed a larger house for their family. They're growing, and there's an implied pain that there were promises that were broken in the past for them. So this is their pain and how they move through it. And then, of course, we have the picture of the happy dad and, and kid. So you can talk about what your clients are going through, and then you can give examples through story of how they can come through this and actually resolve their pain and get to a happier place. So now we're talking about pain. Let's talk about pleasure, and not in that you clean your minds out. Seriously, all of you. Right now, I, I heard it right there. Identify the pleasure. Now, most of you have a service or a, a goods or an expertise that people need in some capacity, and some of it is primarily designed to resolve a pain. Like I met somebody who does human resources. That is a pain that you can help to resolve big time. But there's also pleasure, and the pleasure is that I would be able to concentrate on the people who are growing my business. And helping things to happen. So pleasure is a big deal in that whole advertising thing. So let's talk about how we do that for pleasure. Now, um, you can use a lot of different mediums to tell stories, and it used to 
be that if you wanted to use video, you were gonna have to get a camera like that big one over there, hire a crew that spent tens of thousands of dollars, days upon days upon days, and lots of editing to get a story done. But now, we have this really marvelous gadget that rides around in our pocket. It's our cell phones, right? I have made amazing videos with just my cell phone. So I wanted to give you a story, um, a couple of stories that I used video for. Now this one um, is a little house, and I'm just gonna talk over it a little bit. Um, this is a house which ha it was gonna be for a small family. And the people who lived in it were going to have the dog that they got so they didn't have to have a baby right away. I just knew that. And so we did this whole video from the dog's point of view, and we told the story of what it would be like to have their cute little dog in this house. This is a story where you can see yourself in it. It's like, oh yeah, I can see my dog in there. This would be so great. We would have a wonderful life in this house because that really resonates with the people who wanted that kind of a property. So let's go to the next one. Let's hope that this... Okay, oh, there we go. All right, next one. So in this next video, I need to introduce it because um, I'm talking on it. And I also weigh about 30 pounds more, so don't, don't judge. Um, this is a house that was really, really a small house. And the people who lived in it was a professional pastry chef. And so she spent, it was a $500,000 house way back then. And she spent like over $100,000 on this kitchen. It was ridiculous. And so I figured that the person who would want to buy this house was seeking the pleasure of a professional grade kitchen, something that really helped them uh, manifest their love of entertaining and cooking. So, what do you do when you have a great kitchen? You do a cooking video. I'm Kendall Young with Hellas Properties, and I want to show off the most amazing cook's kitchen I have ever seen, and I thought, better way to show this off than to give you a little cooking demonstration of my famous big appetizer. The great news is, all the ingredients are close by, so come along, we're going to get cooking. Just a few blocks away from my listing at my favorite grocery store here in Glendale, <laughs> Dr. <Martin>. <laughs> <laughs> It's a great store. <laughs>
anyone who just lived in this house can be very, very happy. Okay, now it's time to taste our big appetizers. Oh my God, look at that. Mm. So juicy, so good. Biggest oh, joy in the world. <laughs>
And then the resolution, she's now very, very happy at Windsor Manor. Her best friend is at Windsor Manor as well, and she is moving into a different part of her life. Another story would be Alec and Alex. So you know them, right? Some of my favorite people. They, like so many millennials, had zero, and I too, zero money for a down payment. It is so hard to get that money together for a down payment. And so we told the story of how they came up with a creative way to, and it did involve the parental units, so you know it's not like the money fell from the sky, but they had a very creative way of solving that problem and involving their parents in the purchase of their condo. It took us two years to figure out how to do this, and I was their wise guide along the way, but they were the ones who were the hero of the journey. They, they actually came up with the idea, I don't know why Alec Al Al came up with it, because he's the nerd, of how to structure this entire thing, um, and we were able to get them into their condo, and now they're living a wonderful lifestyle where they have a place where all their friends gather for dinner, including me, on occasion. Um, and then I love this story. This is the Bautic family. Um, Keso, that's the one down there with the glasses. Keso's on the autism spectrum. And they had a house they loved in Tehaka, but they needed to get to a home in a better school district in La Crescenta. And where they were going, there was no way that they were going to be able to buy a house contingent from the sale of their current home. And so they, again, it took them two years to figure out how we were going to get them from point A to point B. Along the way, they had a lot of travails, they had a lot of setbacks, they had to figure out how to fix up some of the stuff in their house that needed to fix, they needed to figure out how to um, move their sensitive autistic son into the transition from one place to another, and they worked really, really hard. We were their wise guide along the way. But they were the heroes of their story, and this is actually a picture we took on the doorstep of their new house, and that's how happy they are. They were the heroes, and this is the pleasure that they were able to get to. If you want to see any of these stories and read the narrative to see how we made this a story that people can see themselves into, you can go to soulbydigs.com backslash soul stories. And you can read some of the things we're doing, and we're, we're adding to these all the time. But we think that this is a way to show people how that someone had their problem, their challenge, their fears, and they were able to move through it. And because they can see themselves in that story, they'll feel empowered to do the same. And, well, we're the wise guide that helps them along the way. So you might be thinking that you can only talk about your your client, or you can only talk about things, and you're wondering, when am I ever going to brag about myself? When am I ever going to promote my business? I mean, I'm really awesome, and I need to tell people that. I don't mean that you can't talk about yourself. I just mean that when you talk about yourself, leave room for the client in the story. So this is an ad that I wrote, ran a really long time ago, back when I didn't have gray hair. I am the changing face of real estate. I am the ears that hear what your home means to you. The eyes that seek out the perfect buyer. Promise to guide you every step of the way. I am commitment to your satisfaction. I'm Kevin Young, and I will sell your home. This is a story that talks about me, yes, but it's really talking about you and what I can do for you and what your concerns are and what you need from a wise guide along the way. Now, I have one last slide for you, um, and it actually comes with a gift. So we are doing, whoo, we're doing a little bit of a drawing. So if you didn't have your business card in there, now would be a good time to put it in there. Is anybody put their business card in the bowl? We're good? Okay, cool. So along the line of story, when we get a listing contract signed or a buyer representation agreement signed, we want to give them a, an experience very similar to when you buy an Apple gadget and you open up that beautiful white box. Doesn't it feel great? It feels like there's such quality inside. Your life is going to be better because of that gadget inside. I can't think of the other one that feels that way, but that's, ah, uh, that day, the other one computer box is one of the best things for me. My husband laughs, but it's true. So, <laughs> so we actually have what we call the welcome box. Um, so the welcome box is here, and it's a white box, and inside is, um, Logo mugs, some Chazo Tranquility Tea, because, you know, 
one needs to calm the head down. A couple of fresh baked muffins, because who doesn't love muffins, really? And then there's a card inside. And here's what the card says. The journey ahead is a big one. We can't promise that everything will be smooth or perfect, but we can promise that everything will be easier because we're at your side. Welcome to Diggs, we've got your back. This is a story, and it's designed to evoke a particular feeling. There's lots of room for the customer in this story. We are just the wise guides that help them along the way. So what I have for you is this welcome box. So can I have the bowl, please? I will not look. Uh, Sylvia Chin from the YWCA. Somebody wants to kill it. You're one of our three, the YWC is one of our three uh, designated charities, nonprofits that we support in days. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, so are there any questions? Oh, I did such a good job. There's no questions. So, oh, okay. What keeps me inspired? I, uh, I have an insatiable curiosity. I am so curious about people. I am so curious as to what motivates them, what communication makes them feel a certain way, how I can be valuable in what I do in their lives. Um, I actually have a degree in theoretical communication, so Facebook is my personal laboratory. And I love watching how people are interacting with each other and how, how people are influencing the behaviors, attitudes, and actions of others uh, when they're not shouting at each other. <laughs> Another question? Uh, I, right there, Mary? Mary? Yeah. 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 I, I'm just wondering because I get MLS emails right now because I'm just getting an overkill of houses. And before I, I even look at the story, I look at the pictures. And 30, 40% of the houses, they can't believe who took the pictures. And what is happening there? I mean, people are not even cleaning up their house before somebody takes a picture. It's the worst angle ever. So the question, so the question is, why are the pictures so bad on the multiple list? Yes. Oh, honey, I can speak for like hours. Let's just suffice to say that I have a personal file that I won't share with any of you labeled bad MLS pictures. It's for my personal enjoyment. Um, part of it, a large part of it, is because if there's no bar to entry to being a real estate agent, and there's really no training to speak of on how to be valuable to the customers, and so people will do what they think of to do. They didn't get an MBA, they don't have a marketing degree, um, and so they're just kind of shooting from the hip. Um, and so they're out there. I love the drive-by. I like. I love the pictures where somebody is in the car, doesn't bother getting out. They stick their cell phone out the window as they're driving by. They take a picture. That's my favorite. The other favorite that I love is when they hire a professional photographer and they take 85 pictures of an 1,100 square foot and the first 10 pictures of the front door. But as to why, it's just because they've not been trained. They've not been shown what is effective and valuable. Another question? Yes. Uh, how has your business model changed to reflect the changes in the digital media landscape? How has my business model changed to reflect the digital media landscape? Oh, biology. So um, I started blogging in 2007. And up until 2007, my business pretty much ran because I, I never actually believed in um, junk mail. So I didn't do it. Um, and so all of my business was done face to face um, and door knocking. Yeah, yeah, I door knock. I'm one of those. But I'm really funny and engaging. People don't mind. Um, so when I started blogging in 2007, I found that I had a voice. And what was important to me at that time was writing what I call consumer empowerment articles. I really, I love writing things like six best questions to ask at open house and why. Uh, or what does it actually mean to remove a loan contingency and where is the danger? I'm one of those types. Um, so the way that digital media is that I found a way to be an expert and an authority in a much wider audience than just the person that I can talk to face to face. And for me, it was a tremendous 
it was it reflected who I was. Because um, I'm, I'm actually not much of a salesperson. The whole look at me, I'm number one, and do this, and never, I don't know, I never liked that. So, so that's how it's changed. So what platform are you on now currently? Um, so the platforms that I use, uh, the primary one for me is Facebook because my primary audience is Ma and Pa Kent, and Ma and Pa Kent are on Facebook. Um, so that's where I spend the bulk of my um, efforts. Um, my blog or my website, which is glendaledigs.com, I probably should have given that to you guys, sorry. That's how you get, you can get a hold of me. Um, glendaledigs.com is my primary website, and um, that's, that we put a lot of our stuff there. We do that classic uh, hub and spoke. So our website, Glendale Digs, is our hub, and then all of our stuff spokes out from that. And those of you who are technologists know exactly what I'm talking about. If you don't, come and see me, I'll explain it to you. Um, and then we do a fair amount on Instagram because what we do is so visual um, and just really good. God has spoken. I guess it's time to get off. No, I'm just <laughs> um, no, Instagram is really good because we have, uh, in addition to Mom Pod Kent, we, our other um, primary audience is what I call the urban expat, and those are people who are probably more suited culturally to living in the urban areas of Echo Park, Silver Lake, you know, downtown LA, but they choose to live in Glendale because we're, we're awesome, basically. But, right, so um, th that's our other ones, and those people are more on Instagram. Thank you. Great question. I don't do the Twitter because it doesn't make sense to me, and Snapchat makes me nauseous. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes? I'm gonna throw a totally hypothetical story or question out there. Let's say the city of Glendale really wants to get a co-working space. Uh, what type of story should we tell in order to get a, a higher co-working space in the city? Uh, Laura, that might be above my pay grade, John. <laughs> but um, I mean, this should be extemporaneous. Thank God I actually have experience in extemporaneous speaking. Um, if I were to tell a story about co-working, it would be about a pain. I would probably talk, choose a story about pain. Um, and I would choose a story about the hassles of finding, managing, outfitting, uh, you know, it, unstopping toilets, that sort of thing, trying to figure out why the Wi-Fi doesn't work, and the pain of not wanting to have to do that because what they really want to do is their awesome business, right? And so the co-working space would be about how effective they would be growing their business faster, better, and attract better employees because they don't have to concentrate on these really stupid things like toilets, telephones, and Wi-Fi. So that would be my story. And then I would probably have pictures of really impossibly beautiful people, you know, <laughs> happy in their co-working space, sitting on bean bags, sipping nachos, and with a, with a bulldog by their feet, something like that, you know, yeah. Or Boston Terry. I think Boston Terriers are really in with the yups. <laughs> I'm not one, so don't ask me. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. Um, so I was wondering, your stories show that you understand your customer really well. How did you figure out each customer? Great question. She wants to know, how did I understand my customer? Um, this has been years in the making. Um, I think about this stuff a lot, which is unusual in the real estate space. I would refer you again to the book Difference by Bernadette Jiwa. Um, Bernadette J-I-W-A. This was a foundational book for me. And what she talked about was that in order to understand your customer, you need to understand what immutable truth you believe about your industry and about your service um, and about your product. And then to think about the immutable truths that your target client thinks about your industry, your product, and your service. And then to think about what it is that you have that intersects with those two things so that you can understand exactly how you want to be valuable to the clients that you most want to work with. So as an example, my target client believes that great design has great value. And when I say design, I don't mean my logo, which is a kick-ass logo, but that's not what I'm talking about. Design is about how we sell houses and move through the transaction. And many of you have bought houses. 
and maybe you bought houses and the whole thing was just a chaos freak where your real estate agent was reacting to the latest fire and you were calling them at 10.30 at night because you didn't know what was going on. That's bad design. Good design is when your real estate agent thinks 16 steps ahead of you do, and you get an email about something that allays your fears that you didn't know you had, but now that you've had this email, you realize you would have had that fear, but now you don't have it because somebody thought about it ahead of time. That's good design, right? So my clients appreciate that, are willing to pay for it, and want to work with someone who has it. So that that's that's kind of a, an idea of how you think about what your customer is, what they need, and, and, and to deliver that. But yeah, I, would, I, I thought that book was freaking awesome. So, uh, Bernadette Jiwa, J-I-W-A. Um, yeah, it was kind of a blueprint of what I do. The other thing is to think about your clients, not so much in demographics, but in psychographics, right? So demographics is how old are they, are they male or female, are they college educated or not college educated? I would encourage you to think about it in terms of psychographic. What do they believe in? Who, who do they follow? What are their causes? What, what, what's important to them? That would be a psychographic trend. When you think of things in psychographic trends, you craft your stories to appeal to who they, who they are. Yeah, because, you know, 55-year-olds, I'm going to be 55. What I've noticed about 55 is we're like teenagers. The range of who we are is ridiculous. There are 55s who have got one, one foot in the grave, and there are 55s that are still jumping out of airplanes. If you're just thinking about in terms of demographics, you're going to miss it. Okay? So, psychographics what I would do. Any other questions? Okay. Oh, yes. Your personality is reflected in your stories. As you grow your business, how do you uh, manage you know, the people that you hire to reflect your brand? So how am I going to um, scale me, <laughs> right? How am I going to take my personality and, so, um, you know, uh, watch this space. It's an evolving thing. Um, it's incredible. The reason I named it Diggs, does anybody want to know why I named it Diggs? Because it's cool Diggs, man. <laughs> I got that inspiration from my really good friend Tracy, who is the genius about marketing. Um, I just like inspired a girl to be like her. Got my gray hair. I'm going there. Um, so yeah, no, it's cool Diggs, because that's where it is. Our whole tagline is that we are matching up cool people with cool homes. Uh, but in any case, I didn't want to name it Kendall and Company because I'm not that important. What's important is the concept of serving the customer and being valued to the customer. And everything that we do is from the point of view of does it make it better for the customer? Does it serve them? So I don't think that takes my personality, um, but my hope is that I will no longer need to sell homes and I'll just teach my agents how to live that life and be that value. Yeah. Anything else? Well, thank you so much for being here this evening. Um, we represent cool people in cool homes in those areas, Glendale, Montrose, Lockerston, Lafayette, Los Angeles, Pasadena, and a little bit beyond that. And if you want to talk to us or contact us, that's our stuff down there. I would love to talk to any of you about any of these topics. Thank you.